live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetWorksRadio.com presents David Walker, K Grow in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday, October 17th, 2019. Boy, there are things happening once again. And uh, as it turns out, the president of the United States, or the guy who says he's the president anyway, and I don't know, all of the press appears to believe him, has uh, been at the center of it all. Because, well, he's a dotard, and we know it, and uh, it's time to catch up with the stupid things that he has done in the time since we last met. Uh, one other item, uh, certainly up for discussion today, although I don't know if I have anything to add to it other than to read through uh, the reporting on it. Congressman Elijah Cummings, the chairman of the House Oversight Committee, integral to these impeachment proceedings, has died. And I, I, I gather that uh, this was not a complete surprise to, I guess, the people closest to him, but... The rest of us, I think, were pretty much caught by surprise. The leaves, uh, I mean, there are political considerations, leave something of a vacuum at the leadership of an important committee, but I'm pretty sure that they will uh, proceed apace once they set aside some time for actually dealing with the loss here. But uh, that's actually up a front page, top of the page at the moment at Daily Coast. No surprise, Mark Sumner has prepared the news and obituary of sorts for him uh very well respected on both sides of the aisle if that's still a possible thing in the united states of america and uh even so far even trump has managed not to make a idiotic mistake and say something horrible about him now that he is dead uh <clears throat> So much to uh, much to catch up on, as I mentioned to you. Greg Dworkin will be joining us. I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about a number of issues, not the least of which I'm sure uh, is, uh, well, I'm sure he'll have something to say about, con- I don't want to put you under pretty pressure, you're not meant to eulogize him necessarily, but I'm sure that will come up. And uh, we also have uh, news of yesterday's, I guess, relatively brief meeting between Democrats, congressional Democrats, and uh, the Trump team at the White House. Uh, they were summoned for a meeting, I guess, was supposed to be about Syria, but it ended up being name-calling and, well, well literal finger-pointing. And uh, Trump uh, had the White House distribute a photo from the session, which uh, everyone is second-guessing. Uh, he, I guess, believed that it was a photo of uh, depicting a, a very clear meltdown, as he put it on on Nancy Pelosi's behalf. But of course, I guess he came out second with that accusation. Um, and the first one to use the meltdown word was Nancy Pelosi, who, ha- upon leaving the meeting, storming out of the meeting, depending on who you ask, uh, went to the microphones, talked to the press and said, you know, couldn't stay. The president is essentially out of touch with reality and having a meltdown. No point in our staying there and discussing something as serious as Syria with him. So uh, it was a pretty incredible exchange, according to the reporting, and it broke down into finger pointing and name calling pretty quickly. And, uh, well, we'll get the lowdown on that when we speak to Greg later on in our second hour. Ian Reifowitz going to join us again. It's been some time since we spoke with him. Uh, We'll catch up on old times and idiotic presidents and uh wow there's there's just so much to to talk about well one of the things uh that also came up <clears throat> early for me early this morning a letter from the white house that i guess this is the second time this week that the press has been forced to seek confirmation from the white house about the authenticity of a letter that came out from the White House. Uh, There were some questions about that letter from the White House counsel's office that was described as being bananas at the end of last week. And then that one turned out to have been mostly dictated by Donald Trump. And now this one, uh, I guess they just thought was dumb and childish looking enough that they wondered, you know, 
is the president really claiming that he sent this? Is this a is this a joke? Is this a prank? A uh, a short one pager <clears throat> to President Erdogan of of Turkey, uh, basically, uh, well, a string of his uh, catchphrases: "Let's make a good deal," uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you know, we're, we're the greatest. But then I love the ending of this one. Uh, history will look upon you favorably if you get this Syria and uh, and the Kurds done the right and humane way, which I'm sure would be would be great. Uh, whatever that is, it will look upon you forever as the devil, though, if good things don't happen. Not likely to be the outcome here. Good things. Don't be a tough guy. Don't be a fool. Exclamation point. And then I will call you later. And then sincerely. Donald J. Trump with a little smiley face. He should have put at the end of that one. I'll call you later. Um, I mean, I guess on its face, <clears throat> nothing outrageous, but uh, one might be forced to wonder whether the president of the United States really wrote such a thing. And it turns out that he, he did. And so uh, Nobel Prize in the offing from, for literature, which is really a, a, a twist on the story. And, uh, you know, he's long wanted one. I'm sure he'll accept the literature one before the peace prize. Since, of course, yesterday his position was the Turks and the Kurds are fighting. Let them. And I, I guess he backed off from that position or forgot that he took that position, more likely. All right. Greg Dworkin is here. And I'm sure you've got things to say about the weirdness of the White House and other things. Yeah, I mean, it's you? just... Uh... There was times I would come on on a Monday and feel like I had to do this summary because so much happened since Friday. Yes. But I was just on the show yesterday and I feel like right. I have to do a summary it, because there do. was so it's much happened since yesterday. Many, many things. Okay. Uh, so uh, where to start? Uh, on Elijah Cummings, you know, yes. uh, a giant. I mean, that's all you can say. One of the most respected people in Congress. And uh, you probably have more to say about it than I do having been there. But uh, I'll throw in this anecdote that I just learned this morning that I didn't know, and only because uh, it gives you an idea of how respected he was on both sides of the aisle. I didn't know that Elijah Cummings married Mika and Joe from Morning Joe. Uh, No, I guess I I certainly didn't know that either. That's that's interesting, to say Uh, the least. You know, uh, Scarborough knew him from Congress and asked him to do it, and they were friends, and and, uh, he did. And so it just points out how deeply respected he was on both sides of the aisle. Hmm. Yes, which is which is a not common thing these days. Uh, right, that's true. Also, you know, marrying your your colleagues. I mean, well, it's performing the wedding together. But uh, yes. you know, the, the the fact that he was asked is my point. Without yes. getting into Scarborough's story, this is Cummings' story. Mm-hmm. Yes, Scarborough's story is weird. All yeah, right. well, you know that too. Yeah. Uh, and as for the uh, meeting that took place, uh, there's a a lot to unpack on that in terms of what's mm. happening with Syria. But I just, I want to do, if I can find it, because I put it aside, a McClatchy story. Yes. Of all things. Uh, okay. about sure. About what's going on in uh, uh, Syria and reaction from uh, people in the evangelical community. Hmm. Okay. And the reason I do so is not because uh, I'm a big fan of the white evangelical super conservative community, but it gives you an idea of the kind of pressure Trump is under. Hmm. And I don't even know if I have it on my list, but even if I do, here it is. Okay. Uh, Pence and Pompeo in damage control with Christians over Trump's Kurdish crisis. That's a very and- alliterative And this was published yesterday. Mm -hmm. Christian leaders were blindsided last week by President Donald Trump's sudden withdrawal of U.S. forces from northern Syria that left thousands of Kurds vulnerable to attacks. They sought audience with Pompeo and Pence, the two officials they thought could convince the president to change course. But both men, evangelical Christians, fell conspicuously silent. Mm -hmm. They took several days to call members of a politically active Christian community perplexed by a decision they considered a betrayal of U.S. moral authority. And go. And the, the article goes on to talk about uh, the sacrifice that the Kurds did on our behalf. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Tony Perkins, Family Research Council, said this thing did shake the evangelical community a little bit. This was uncharacteristic of this administration. Maybe. And uh, Maybe. part of the article goes on to say that uh, basically everybody was taken by surprise 
lending credence, number one, to the idea that Trump just blew it on the phone call and his unconventional way of not going through State Department and having experts help him with these things showed up in an enormous mistake, which is going to change U.S. international relationships for the next two decades and uh, threatens war in the Middle East, which we've been trying to avoid since forever. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that that's part of it. But the other part of it is that don't forget everything Trump does, at least in theory, uh, if not in practice, is to shore up his evangelical base, because without them, he knows he's doomed and he's probably yeah. doomed with them. But that's another story. Uh, and so for him to not even consult them, for him to blindside them, yeah. for him to put Pompeo and Pence, both of whom are not only evangelical Christians, but extraordinarily ambitious politicians in a situation where they have to defend the indefensible, gives you an idea that it was a spur of the moment, I blew it kind of call rather than anything planned. Yes. Well, most of his things are. But... So now he has to undo the damage and damage indeed it is not just, I mean, in terms of international relationships and the standing of the U.S., but his own political damage in terms of his, his uh, relationship with, with everybody else. So he's got pressure on that side. He's got pressure from, uh, uh, you know, uh, Republicans in Congress. Different issue altogether. Mm. In terms of, you know, uh, they're not being happy with what's going on. Uh, nobody believes him. But of course, Lindsey Graham said, I'm going to be Trump's worst enemy on this for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, but but again, illustrating the point that they never say this. So the fact that they're saying it is a big deal. Uh, and then I don't know if you caught this, but this is all part of the same kind of pressure that Trump is getting. Club yeah. for Growth hmm. released this really bizarre attack ad. Okay. The person they're attacking yeah. is Mitt Romney. Uh, why? So I, I have that included. There. Because Mitt Romney is working as a secret asset for Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats wow. plotting to take down real Donald Trump through impeachment. Now his cover okay. is blown. They show Romney in those aviator sunglasses, so they actually make him look cool, you know. <laughs> really? They make him look like one of those spy movies. Tell Romney to stop colluding with Democrats now, and they have stop. a website. So obviously they're getting worried about it, because if you're wondering where the billions of dollars that, uh, uh, only a slight exaggeration, that Brad Parscal is raising, where it's going, it's going for crap like this. Hmm. Um, and, right. and why are they doing it? Because they okay. know they're in yeah. trouble. So my point is that Trump is getting pressure put on him from the right, let alone the pressure that uh, Democrats are putting on him through impeachment. And that's the background for that bizarre meeting that took place today to talk about really what should one do with Syria, because Trump yes. made this incredible error, led to all of this. He can't admit it because, you know, he's just not able to. Constitutionally, he simply cannot, and I don't mean uh, like the U.S. Constitution, I mean what that makes too. him tick. He is not capable of admitting error ever. Yes, well, and he can't read it either. And so whenever something happens, he turns around and points a finger and said, no, you did it. Yes. I mean, Trump is the uh, I'm rubber, you're glue president. So, you know, whatever he's accusing somebody of, he did. I mean, that's just the way it works. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. So what happens? He says, OK, well, Nancy Pelosi melted Ooh. down in that meeting. OK, a little bit of a. And that means that happened. Nancy Pelosi Structure. didn't melt down in that meeting. That uh, means he yeah, did. That, that'll what did he do? Figure it out. Yes. First of all, <laughs> among other things, according to the reporting, yeah. he uh, uh, belittled uh, Mattis, General Mattis. He said he didn't know anything. Man, I'm a much better general than he is. Just... And uh, he started going on and on about stuff. And uh, Nancy Pelosi just looked at him and said, all roads lead to Putin with you. Yes. <laughs> and that's probably when he lost it. But there's a picture. <laughs> he, therefore, went out and tweeted official picture from White House uh, photography of this, uh, you know, big uh, conference table. And Trump is holding this meeting. And across from him is Nancy Pelosi. She's the only one standing. Yes. And she's obviously giving him a piece of her mind. So Trump tweets this around and says, uh, nervous Nancy had a breakdown. And uh, Pelosi chuckled at this and actually put it on her website. It's now her yeah. banner picture. <laughs> it's a, and it's and as bad. many people noted online, 
She's standing up. She's a woman standing up to Trump. She's the only one standing up to Trump. The only Clearly one looks the like the grown up in the room. Yeah. And that's basically mm-hmm. how that uh, report is, is coming out. Meanwhile, while all that is going on, talk about other pressure on him. Today is the day that Gordon Sondland is testifying oh, yes. in front of Congress. And last night, NBC News has this piece, Sondland asked Ukrainian officials during private White House talk about gas firm linked to Hunter Biden. Sondland's meeting with Ukrainian officials just steps from the White House Situation Room came minutes after a larger meeting that included John Bolton. So Sondland started to talk about this in the meeting with Bolton. Bolton shut the meeting down because he didn't want to have any part of it. Hmm. Sondland still has a private discussion with top Ukrainian officials, quote unquote, in the yes, White House, top men. where he took them down to the basement near the washing machines, <laughs> pointed out, because yes. when you're in a mob, that's, that's where you have all your here. best meetings, and specifically talked about that's the, sound effect. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the company that uh, Trump wanted investigated, Burisma Holdings. Yes, right. Okay, so... Sondland's cover story is, yeah, well, I repeated uh, in that famous tweet where I said, no, this isn't a quid pro quo. Everybody knows that. Right. Uh, Looking directly at the camera. That's taping everybody. (laughs) Not Uh, guilty. But his cover story, yeah, I said it, but that's because Trump told me to. I didn't really know anything about it. But here he is setting that up, uh, Hmm. you know, and that story comes out the day before he comes and testifies. So his cover story about not knowing is blown because he was clearly part of it. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that uh, Wall Street Journal is also reporting that basically Rick Perry and he uh, and Volcker, who was also back in uh, Capitol Hill to testify, were all part of, uh, you know, trying to do something here. And uh, I still contend that Hmm. the whole giant picture is actually really not that complicated. Arms for dirt is shorthand for Trump using the entire cabinet apparatus to try and cheat on the next election and ensure he got foreign help, just like he did last time. Everything Mm -hmm. else is details. And so these details are coming out here. And it's an indefensible position. And when the Republicans say, well, he didn't do it. okay, he did it. But it wasn't quid pro quo. okay, it was quid pro quo but uh, not in a a criminal sense. Okay, well, maybe it was, but it's certainly not (laughs) impeachable. Uh, Well, this is impeachable. Yes. Um, And and so each one of the, so this is the pressure they're having from the impeachment side. He's getting crap from his Republican hawks in terms of what's going on in the Middle East, as well as the realists and the real (laughs) politic people, including the Israeli lobby, who's not particularly happy with the war in the Middle East right now. And then he's getting even a little bit of pressure, such as it is, from the evangelical community who finds itself not being able to defend this. Don't forget, Pat Robertson told Trump that if he goes ahead with this uh, Curtis slaughter, he will lose the mandate of heaven. Yes. I mean, this isn't playing around when you're talking about that to the evangelical network where Trump cannot afford to lose a single vote. And so all of this pressure is happening on him. And basically, you see how he responds. He responds with a Sharpie letter that he didn't ask anybody before he sent, <laughs> which uh, BBC reports Turkey just threw in the garbage. And on the same day that they received it, invaded Syria. Oh, well, that's... uh, So that's their answer. I guess so. (laughs) All right. And so now he has to say face. Yeah. And he sends Pence and Pompeo and and, uh, the DNI director, O'Brien, over to talk to uh, uh, Erdogan, who who originally refused to meet with him. There isn't a photo op of him and Pence sitting next to each other looking extremely unhappy. (laughs) But you can't salvage this. No, at least they met. Uh, there, there is that. They did threaten to not bother meeting with him, and I thought he was going to run off to Moscow to meet with Putin. Was the story, and he he hung around long enough to sit next to Pence. Right. So basically, you have somebody this incompetent, Pence. this corrupt, this bad as president, and now you're having, uh, you know, the uh, the cheating on the election and a genuine foreign policy uh, uh, crisis. Mm. slash disaster that he created all converging on the same thing yes which is pretty remarkable and right in the middle of it are half his cabinet yep and uh, they were a half a cabinet to begin with right so uh let me throw in this also latest polls this is from uh, josh jordan one of my conservative friends on twitter in the uh, romulan neutral zone for polling who collects Mm -hmm. these things Latest polls asking if Trump should be impeached and removed from office would change in net points pre-inquiry to now. And the inquiry is only a couple of weeks old. Fox News 
impeach and remove 5140. That's plus 14 points in that direction. Quinnipiac 4549. That's plus 16 points in that direction. Well, Morning Consul 5043. That's 20 points in that direction. Hmm. CNN 4745. 15 points in that direction. Harris X, which is Scott Rasmussen's new shop. 5038, 16 points in that direction. Washington Post, 4938, 33 points in that direction. And Gallup, which just came out the other day, 5246, 15 points in that direction since their last polls pre-inquiry. So even with only the information that we have now, things are moving with the public. And if they are soon to be at like 55% remove him. Yeah, removal. And that's what we're talking about here, not just impeach. That like two thirds of the country is ready to go ahead and impeach him. That's what it usually. But more takes. than half the country is ready to remove him already. This makes all of these uh, stories, and uh, especially cable media questions about, well, what happens if he's impeached, survives the Senate, and then is reelected? What mm -hmm. are you talking about? How tone deaf do you have to be to start asking that question, or are uh, you doing it because that's the propaganda that Trump wants you to think? Mm -hmm. And he's somehow or other. Uh, there's, rising there's above story. all of this, immune to it all. He's Teflon, nothing. Right? That's all bullshit. Well, yes. Right? I hope he's so, cracking, <laughs> and the walls he's are spreading. caving in. That's crazy. And this is not the time to be talking about what if he's reelected. It's not yeah. that he can't be. No. But that's not I mean, what we're seeing. Why don't you report what we're seeing? Yeah. I, I, I guess, I don't know. I mean, at, at some point, uh, somebody must be thinking, well, uh, you know. It's Enough negative news he's... about him. They're complaining oh. about it all the time. My <laughs> well, there's certainly bosses, that, probably. You know, are, are getting heat from the White House all the time. I'm sure that's And so uh, some put up a positive Trump story. I guess, if that's a positive Trump story. <laughs> what, if he's, what if he's so reviled that he's uh, impeached but survives it and is uh, elected again anyway, even though everybody knows you know, that he's that's cheating? That's the best you can do. That's uh, the best you can hmm, do. I guess so. That's the best. That's a, that was the most positive story you could give me. Yeah, well, but pretty much. I guess uh, so. we could cover your actual news in terms of what you did. Yeah, he also right. had his bizarre mm -hmm. press conference the other day, uh, uh, was... which uh, it was before meeting with the Italian prime minister. Ah, I was thinking uh, he, was he just, do something you know, I, I, I hate when cable news covers his press conferences live. There should be like a five minute <laughs> delay. Yeah. And yeah. cut out the propaganda and just give us the news. I, I assume I still I figure that they're still doing that. On the assumption that he'll say something terrible or goofy. Well, you know, he, he went still, off on a rant about I mean, how the 2016 election that. was stolen and it was stolen from him. Yes. And there was a conspiracy sure. against president. him. And it was all I mean, it's all this uh, uh, 4chan, HN uh, conspiracy stuff, Alex Jones stuff that mm -hmm. he's just spouting for like five, ten minutes. Yeah, and I guess there you have, like, okay, it would be interesting to have meetings with the editors and say, now you're covering these things in case he says something crazy. Now here he has said something crazy, so what are you going to do? What are you going to yeah, uh, And they're like, oh, oh, I didn't well, what that, if he wins? That, you know, that is not the right reaction to what's going on here. <laughs> okay? We make so, crazy like he came dressed uh, in a raccoon Times, of course, suit. The New York Times things, uh, and they're covering the story that mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pelosi and Trump had a meeting. And here's their headline. Someone had a meltdown at the White House. Pelosi and Trump disagree on who. Yeah. I mean. Right? Jesse Eisinger, who is a senior reporter at ProPublica, says this is an inexcusable New York Times headline. To soften and normalize Trump's behavior on this week of all weeks is something else. Hmm. And uh, even uh, John Harwood said this is a mindless and irresponsible headline. So uh, uh, they're not getting any better at the Times. Hmm. Yeah, uh, apparently not. I mean, for the for the in the main, you can't put a headline out like that because there are going to be people who just don't know what happened. They're going to wake up to this and and think that there's some question as to who had the meltdown. Where I I guess I will say this: my reading of it, when I read the thing, I I don't know whether this was their intent, but to me, it feels like somebody who was writing the headline tongue in cheek. Because of course, if there's a question about there was a meltdown, and which one was it? It was Trump, and it's pretty obvious, but that only works internally for me, well, and I'm one of very few, whereas uh, uh, the rest of the country needs to know, nah, 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 Trump had a meltdown. I'll give you a better headline, something. which which Sean Harwood wrote, okay. uh, not as a headline, but he just wrote it in a separate tweet. It says, Pelosi on Trump as House investigates all roads lead to Putin. That yes. should have been the goddamn headline. Yeah, well, okay. They had that, and that was hanging out there, and they forgot to do it. Plus, it's an Infrastructure Week comment. Sure. They love those. Exactly. Yeah, it's all about roads. Mm-hmm. 
So yes. like you get, you know, the states into it and, and, and it's all right. great. It's a shovel ready project. Uh, I love project. infrastructure week. It's been happening all the time. Right. Uh, shovel ready project. And by the way, when you are, if you are a Putin shovel ready project, it's not what you think. It's, it's well, not building know. a road. You're right. done. So Kevin McCarthy's defense is, well, of course, he didn't really ask for help with the election in 2020. Oh. I mean, if that's what they're going with, they have nothing. He didn't say that. They have nothing. Yes, he did. Oh, he did say that? Yeah. Oh, oh you mean he said that? Uh, McCarthy said that? McCarthy said, no, that's not what Trump was doing. I mean, he's, it, basically, they're taking the Marco Rubio stuff. He was just joking. He didn't really do it. <laughs> he didn't say that. But I'm bumped. All right. right? Well, Sold big job. Yeah. Complete with audience laugh track. Okay. Well, uh, so, wow. What a day. Yeah, um, what a day. And it like it's not even 930. No. I saw Trump tweeting out proudly again that uh, he had achieved 50% approval rating in some poll as though that yeah, were probably a, uh, uh, Rasmussen, the, as yeah. if that matters. All right. I mean, as, as though that was a good thing, like a 50% approval rating is actually not good, and particularly side by side with 51% approval for removing you from office. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's just climbing. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so here's Wall Street Journal good. just to round out the next okay. uh, 30 seconds. Rick Perry called Giuliani this spring at Trump's direction to try to resolve Trump's concerns about meeting Zelensky, which the Ukrainian uh, uh, president. Trump said he wasn't comfortable that Ukraine had straightened up their act and told Perry visit with Rudy. So mm-hmm. back in the spring, uh, Trump directed Perry to work with Giuliani. Giuliani's a crook. He's responsible for this separate shadow uh, diplomacy thing. Yeah. And yeah, it's his entire cabinet. He's using the entire cabinet structure to cheat on the election in 2020. Hmm. Yes. OK. Well, you know, that's like the big problem and what you're not supposed to be using to do these things. You're not supposed to be doing them at all. Uh, involving the cabinet is extraordinarily uh I don't know bad. what to say. <laughs> it's bad. Audacious. Bad. I was gonna, right. It's a, it's a bold play for badness. We'll be right back. It's a bold idea, Con. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, with a brand new, brand new interruption to say thanks to all of you who support the show. Remember when I told you that our average monthly donation was about $7, for which you were getting two great hours of news and entertainment five days a week, and how that came out to about $0.70 cents an hour? That's a pretty good deal, except it's wrong. The math actually works out closer to 17 cents an hour. It is hard to beat a deal like that, and even harder to send your kids to college on. Thankfully, Patreon.com makes it easy to make that work. Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is the simple, secure way to make recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Just search for me or the show name on the site, And they make it easy to crowdfund the show so that the power of our numbers can keep the show going for just a few bucks a month. Once again, thanks so much for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. We uh, charge forward here with, uh, well, let's hope some more polling news. I see you had mentioned, I guess somebody else is in trouble as well. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Um, I'm just uh, laughing over our colleague and friend Barbara Marl's tweet, where I guess she has a a Daily Coast story. Conflict with Trump is doing more than anything else in Pelosi's three decades in the House to uh, make her look like a super cool badass. (laughs) Remember we had the meme with the red coat and the the sunglasses, and now we have this one standing up and taking him on. And I'm I'm just laughing to myself. Do you remember? I'm old enough to remember when uh, a couple of members of Congress decided Pelosi wasn't fit to be speaker. Yes, right. And and they wanted to run against her. And I how do smart does that. that look these days? Uh, yeah, although, well, yeah, with the rest of us, she runs, she runs hot and cold in some ways. But uh, she's got, it seems at the moment anyway, she's got a handle on the Trump and impeachment and what deserves to be happening question. And I'm glad we were able to push her to that there was that time when he was supposed to just self-impeach but i guess that's come and gone so well you know i'm a big picture kind of guy and so uh yeah she does a lot of things wrong she doesn't elevate enough younger people the uh, leadership structure is kind of creaky with the untimely and sad uh loss of elijah cummings question now of course is who's going to run oversight and how that works 
and whether Either anybody way. else is as qualified as he to run the committee. And part mm -hmm. of the reason that there's questions about it is because of if you have a leadership structure that isn't ready to take on the next generation and the next group of people and uh, groom them for leadership, then there's a vacuum when something like this happens. So she does a lot of things wrong. I don't mean to say that she's perfect, but you got to look at the big picture. We're talking about a constitutional position, which is second in line uh, to the yeah, presidency, behind, uh, right? Right. Well, yes. And you have uh, to have somebody who's big enough behind the VP to, to behind the VP, and you have to have somebody big enough to fit that role at the same time as running something as serious as an impeachment, yes. and. You need somebody who can do that regardless of the other flaws they have. Nobody's perfect. Uh, but, you know, who else would fit in that role right now in uh, the Democratic Congress? There, there are very few people who could. And, by the way, uh, use Trump's own divisiveness mm -hmm. to bring about a degree of cohesion in the Democratic office that, that I haven't seen in my memory. Yes, well... We don't have to talk about that problem just yet, thankfully. Although you got to, you're supposed to be planning for it in the background. I know, uh, but what but yes, what I'm saying is, I, you know, who who would I, do I that? She's doing it. I'll she do it. she has done an incredible job in the two big things yeah. that you ask of her: be a leader and keep the caucus together. Yes. And then uh, there's the stuff she doesn't do so well, and that's an issue. And so you're absolutely, and everybody's absolutely right to take her on on that. But don't lose sight of the big picture here. Yes. Well, at, the, at a minimum, you can come away and say, well, Seth Moulton, for instance, would probably not fit the bill. Tim Ryan? Mm, yeah, also not. Probably not. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, there's the separate question of where would they actually turn and uh, are there others who might fit into the role? But uh, typically in these things, uh, everyone has a pretty good idea of, of who's coming next. But And in in, uh, in the Oversight Committee, by the way, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, he was pretty much head and shoulders above the the rank and file in the committee. So it'll be a difficult thing to step into his shoes. But, but they really do have a couple of decent prospects on the committee now for replacement. And, of course, they don't have to take from among them. They, the, the caucus can certainly decide that if they have a giant in waiting to replace him, they can just move him directly into the chairmanship if necessary. But I think I think you'll find uh, it's in capable hands and there are some good people there that can take over. But as for yeah. the speakership, well, well, we don't have that problem and uh, at the moment. And, and be well, glad I just we want don't. to make sure that she gets her due. Here you have yeah. a woman standing up for the country and doing everything that you would want her to do. And you're not going to agree with her on everything. But, you know, just wow. I mean, she did a great job yesterday and just said to his face, all roads lead to Putin. And like, what else would you want of a speaker at, in this uh, parlor's time to do? Yeah. Uh, other things, perhaps. But that's a good one. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty that good. One. One. Anyway, so how's the, this playing in the country? Well, while she's taking it to Trump's face, the Republican senators are dodging and weaving. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's a piece out of Morning Consult. Things aren't getting better for 2020's most vulnerable Senate Republicans. Iowa Senator Joni Ernst saw a drop of nine percentage points, the biggest decline in net approval for any senator. The slide places her underwater with Iowa voters at 39 percent approved and 43 percent disapprove and among the 10 most unpopular senators in the country. Hmm. Why is this important? Okay. She's an impeachment conviction vote. Yes. Well, the kind of pressure you get when trying chance. to play all sides, you know, it, 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 and your numbers are sinking. Yeah. That's a big deal. So uh, there are other people in that situation. Just uh, to give you an idea, uh, Ernst had the biggest slide among vulnerable senators, but she's not the most vulnerable senator. The one who is net approval most underwater right now happens to be Susan Collins. Ah, yeah. Now, she only dropped two points since the last time they looked, but she's a minus six net approval in third quarter 2019. Mm. Okay. Okay. And Tom Tillis is a minus five. He dropped three points. Joan Ears had the biggest drop of nine. She's minus four right now. Corey Gardner's minus three. Martha McSally is plus two. She dropped the point. Doug Jones is plus three. He's at plus five. Gary Peters mm. in Michigan is plus eight. And John Cornyn is hanging out there with uh, plus 18, and he really hasn't changed. 
So uh, Cornyn's Texas. position yeah. is a stretch. Looks like Peters can defend. Doug Jones is one of those Democrats where you're not going to agree with him on all positions, but hope he can survive in a state that basically likes Trump, even though they like him, but they like Trump more than they like him. But he's doing what he needs to do, and he's doing a pretty good job in Alabama and is recognized, and he's got a positive approval. So we'll see what happens there. Yes, he's, uh, he's certainly more endangered. More but McSally, Gardner, Ernst, Tillis, and Collins can all lose based on this. It doesn't mean they will. But even if we're not talking about the election results, same as Trump, the pressure that this puts on them to to simply say, oh, well, you know, Marco Rubio, he was just joking uh, and I don't really have to pay attention and I can just not in, you know, at home, they're getting clobbered on this. Yeah. Well, we saw a lot of video in the last couple of days about uh, Ernst getting confronted about this. And I guess that's what's produced this. And tell us as well, you know, they're, they're like six or seen... seven times they were asked the question. Oh, they yeah. keep trying to avoid it. Same with Cory Gardner. Cory Gardner was uh, was captured on video trying to not answer the question. Mm. Yeah. And that's, well, that's, that's not going to fly. Work. Uh, yeah, I, I, for some reason, I had seen more Ernst footage. I, I don't think I saw any Tillerson. I'm sure it exists, because what else yeah, are you going to uh, ask? Tillis uh, wasn't video. I think that was Tillerson, just description. Tillerson, but Tillerson, uh, Gardner's on video. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I have seen his, but I, I've seen uh, more of the Ernst stuff. That's just, uh, you know, maybe just the vagaries of a Twitter feed and what time are you looking, but... Well, okay. you know, also, it's it's, uh, it's partly a question of what your image is supposed to be at home. If you're supposed to be a plain spoken yeah. senator who just speaks truth, this makes you look terrible. If you're a weasel like Cornyn, it's not going to hurt his image. <laughs> I guess that's true. Rubio's fine. Rubio's fine. Yeah. You know, he's a spineless coward and this fits time. right in. Nobody's surprised at that. But that's not the image that Ernst has uh, propagated. Mm, yeah, I guess not. I mean... It's news to me, whatever the hell she's doing in, in Iowa. But yeah, it's been very uncomfortable moments. And uh, I guess that's off brand for her. Right. Castrator anyway, so what I want to finish up with is uh, something we started yesterday. We were talking about uh, Medicare for All and how that plays. And Jonathan Cohen has this really interesting article in Huffington Post about what's going on in the big picture kind of sense. Oh, okay. Okay. And he titles it, What Medicare for All Would Really Mean for the Middle Class? The answer is more complicated really? than the Democratic debates might suggest. Uh, and he suggests yes, that sure. one of the things that you can do is look at something called the New York Health Act, where New York State is trying to do some of the similar things like Medicare for All, wiping out nearly all existing insurance arrangements to enroll everybody in a brand new state run program. Financing oh. under New York Health Act would come from taxes on payrolls and non-wage income, that is to say, interest and dividends. Uh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't passed. But last year, the Rand Corporation, an independent think tank with its own model for projecting the effects of health care proposals, produced a detailed report on how it would work in New York State. And it's not an easy calculation to make. This is the point I want to emphasize here. When you ask, okay, uh, Elizabeth Warren wants to talk about cost. Her opponents want to talk about taxes. Mm -hmm. What's the real deal there? And the honest answer, nobody knows. And here's why. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy calculation to make because introducing that kind of system inevitably causes so many changes, some of which would push in opposite direction. It's hard to know. People would start using more health care because that makes costs go up. But the New York Health Act would simplify billing and administration because doctors and hospitals wouldn't have to spend time communicating and haggling with private insurance, and that would reduce costs. And in the end, the RAND research has determined the New York Health Act, as designed, would reduce overall spending on medical care. That's a good thing. And as long as taxes to pay for the program were sufficiently progressive, that is to say taxing the rich, the benefits would flow primarily away from the rich and toward lower and middle income groups. So specifically, the richest 10% of New Yorkers would be paying more for health care and the other 90% would pay the same or less. Okay. And that sounds a lot like what Sanders and Warren say their plan would do. But here are the caveats. And there are three big ones. Okay. Okay. Number one, it assumes the richest 10% are going to be paying more. It assumes the richest 10% are not going to find some way of weaseling out of paying their taxes the way they do now. Yes. 
That's, if that yeah. doesn't happen, then the other 90% are going to have to make up the difference. Or we'll have a huge deficit. Well, yeah, but but one way, yeah, you could do anything if you have a huge deficit. Then, yeah. would, then you can have your you know, better services with, with uh, less pay. But that's not sustainable. Damn. You don't have to be a deficit peacock to say you, you, you don't have to pay for everything, but you got to bring it down to some reasonable amount. When people are talking about $6 trillion to do Medicaid for Medicare for all as currently written, as we talked about yesterday, that's an eye-popping number. Uh, how about uh, I forgot my wallet. I'll get you later. Yeah, well, that's not going to fly. So oh. anyway, that's problem number one. At problem number two, off my list. Okay, all right, is yeah. the New York Health Act doesn't specify what the plan would pay doctors and hospitals. Okay. So if Chickens. you don't bring down the costs of paying for hospitals and paying for doctors, then you can't have your savings. Oh. <laughs> All right. And so why is that a big deal? It was a very powerful lobbies. Hmm. And the idea that you can just do this with the wave of the hand, uh, anybody who's ever worked in health reform knows not so simple. The New York Health Act, according to Jonathan Cohen, doesn't actually specify what the plan would pay. They figured that at the outset, health providers would be paid at rates that match the average of what all the different payers in New York, Medicaid, private insurance pay now. But over time, the new system would aggressively limit year-to-year -year inflation. Well, remember the doc fix. That doesn't always work because uh, medical mm. expenditures yes. actually go up generally faster than costs for everything else. Yes. Now, universal coverage there. systems in the rest of the world control costs. Here in the U.S., lobbying groups representing healthcare industry fights to avoid limits on their payments. And uh, if they don't kill it all together, they win more favorable terms with the lobbying. OK, we'll let you do that as long as you let us do this. And that uh, shoots the savings in the foot. Mm. So that inflates the program's cost, forcing the government to raise more revenue. And there are limits to how high taxes on high earners can go, because at some point tax avoidance kicks in and it makes it difficult to increase the revenue. True. Also. Then the third problem is when you say that on average, 90% of the income scale would pay less, that's not every single person guaranteed. That's like saying if you want your doctor, you can keep your doctor uh -huh. with an asterisk unless you have a junk plan. So people in the 90% of the income scale on average would pay less is great unless you're one of the people who pays more. Uh, and the typical example people think of, and this is the one Jonathan gave, 30-year-old buys a skimpy bronze plan on the Affordable Care Act doesn't get a whole lot of care, but doesn't need it because they're generally healthy uh -huh. and isn't paying a lot of money and is paying a ton of money for their apartment. All of a sudden has increased costs because now they get much better care that they're not going to use at this age hmm. and has to pay a lot more to get it. And so they say, well, you told me that I'm in the 90%. I'm barely making it. And now I have to increase my premiums and pay a whole lot more. And sure, I'm getting coverage I don't need. That's not what I wanted. And so you have that problem. And saying 90% of the income scale would pay less for their health care doesn't cover the fact that a lot of the people in that 90% on average, I mean, you know, Bill Gates and I walk in a bar on average, we're rich. That doesn't help the individuals who are going to wind up getting screwed by this. So it, it's, it sounds better when you talk about it as a concept. But when you get down to the details, uh, some of the details are really tricky and it may not work out that way. And you know, forget about, you know, how you pass it. Just looking at what you want to do is a lot more complicated because there are always trade-offs. That's what I'm always telling you. When you look at healthcare, there's always trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So what kind of trade-offs are you willing to do? Are you going to pay the doctors less? You know, I'm okay sure. with surgeons being paid like pediatricians, but the surgeons aren't and they have a pretty powerful lobby. Yes. Uh, are you okay with hospitals getting paid less? They're going to tell you that now that means we're out of business. We already have a rural hospital crisis where we can't afford to take mm -hmm. care of people. And now you're going to shut that them all by real. doing this. Okay. How is that going to play politically? And they're the ones most likely to be paid in chickens. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, you know, so uh, this is one of the things that makes me uncomfortable with, you know, vague promises that it'll be better without looking at the details. Drives me crazy when I hear that. And that's why... 
when in the very, very first debate, you'll recall they had one of those really stupid moderator questions, raise your hand if you want to get rid of private insurance, and just about everybody <laughs> raised their hand, and I thought that was a disaster, because the details matter, and some of those they guys did. walked it back. I hate them, though. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, that's one of the reasons I avoid things like debates and white papers during the campaign, is uh, they're just massive sources of frustration and bear no resemblance to what's going to actually be going on, which we just usually have to wait and see what comes out the other end of the legislative process. And no one's satisfied with that. No one wants to make their decision of who to vote for based on that because it doesn't help. But, right. So yeah. public options tend to be very, very popular. And right. Medicare for all, not nearly as popular. Oh. Uh, Two thirds of voters like the public option. And only half of the voters like Medicare for all, and even less when you start explaining what the trade-offs are. And so that's why the concept of Medicare for all who want it, however you structure that, is a bigger political winner and maybe even better policy than uh, Medicare for all single payer, tell with the costs, let's just blow a hole in the budget yeah. and move ahead. Now, I get why people get annoyed about budget stuff. We're talking about spending a tremendous amount of money on health care, and you probably blew that in Iraq in like three years, you know. Yes. But still, you still have to get this done. You still have to convince voters that this is a good idea. And so you, know, you got work to do. Hmm. One has work to do if that's what one wishes to do. I would like it to be wow. clarified. It's very difficult to simplify Healthcare, and I think that this article helps to explain why it's not that simple. Whatever it is, if you say it's simple, you're getting it wrong. Hmm. If you're not talking about trade offs, you're getting that wrong too. That's entirely likely. That's the way these things usually do work. And, uh, and well, it was one of the reasons I delay in making decisions like that until, until the trading portion of the game starts. Yeah, pretty much. But uh, and you know, it's one of the reasons I hesitate to make decisions about which Democratic candidate I'm supporting at this yes. point. I'm still undecided because I think there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered here. Hmm. All right. Well, we'll do our best to get started on answering them. Okay. Well, you know, that would be good. Why don't you tell okay. them? Um, I'll let them know. Tell them I'm impatient. Yes. Right. And the doctor as well. So. Okay. On the <laughs> other hand, if you want an Elizabeth Warren endorsement. Yeah. Oh, yes. I found one this morning. Oh, well, she would like one. What do you got? Uh, well, it's from USA Today. That's a good one. And Lauren Leader, that's her name, Leader. Really? She must be a leader in her field. Not like the In her fight against corporate America, Warren is turning off a key group of voters who want to oust Donald Trump, the liberal women who work in corporations. Uh, Anti-Trump businesswomen are nervous about Warren, and the Democratic debate didn't help. And if you read the article, oh. it goes on to say basically... They don't like Trump, but they hate the idea that uh, Warren seems to be demonizing corporations. She is the co-founder, Lauren Leader, and CEO of All In Together, a nonpartisan women's political education organization. Mm -hmm. And she's pro-business. It doesn't sound corporate at all. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, I wonder if this lady's ever heard of Facebook. <laughs> Uh, if she's worried about Elizabeth Warren demonizing corporations, yeah, right. I just wonder whether she's heard of Uber or WeWork or any of the the uh, corporate Juicero. news that's been there lately. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm worried about Juicero. I, that's that's my concern. They need to be able to do this, to do their thing, man. Um, I, all right, whatever. That, that. So how does that – that doesn't amount to an endorsement. That's Well, it's like Wall Street saying they're nervous about Elizabeth Warren being elected. Okay. Well, maybe that is really. I feel more positive people. about her after that. Yeah, I guess so. If, if Wall Street Journal is against her, then hmm. All right, I guess that might count as an anti-endorsement. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, but you know, I I do get annoyed when people refer to Warren and Sanders in the same breath as somehow being far left. Mm. Uh, okay. Neither is probably true. But Bernie and uh, Elizabeth Warren are not the same person. They don't have the same policies. On health care, they merge because she's endorsed uh, his policy, at least uh, she had in the past. And as I've told you and told you again today, uh, you know, that's something that I think she's going to have to clarify. But the rest of her policies are fairness, not far left. And uh, they're pretty populist. And I think they're pretty popular. And so, you know, trying to make the case that you can't nominate Elizabeth Warren because Wall Street doesn't like her 
is uh, not exactly the way to go. Hmm. Who doesn't like her? The banksters who would go to jail? Who doesn't like her? Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he's already said he doesn't like her. Well, yes. That's an endorsement. That's an anti-endorsement endorsement hmm. to me, and this is more of the same. Okay. I can take it that way. I, I, I find, well... I don't know what they, there's still people out there who are very worried about uh, corporations because they're people, my friend. And I mean, well, again, a place I, for I, will, concern, I will say but... for the record that when people are talking about kitchen table issues, health care and the cost to the family, their family of health care is first and foremost kitchen table issue. And so, yeah, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. You have to impeach uh -huh. Trump, but you also have to deal with okay. this. So. That's where we're at at the huh. moment, and uh, we'll see if we get any further on this by Monday. Okay. Uh, I'm sure something That's will when I'll change be between now and then. Yeah, right. Look what That's happened the, between the, yesterday and today. Right. We got the Sondland testimony, so that'll be interesting. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other people. You know, it's again, looking back at the big picture, don't forget, Trump has decided that nobody uh, in his uh, administration is going to testify in this sham impeachment hearing. But it turns out everybody important is testifying. Yes, he seems to be losing control of the ability to uh, to, to insist that people not testify. As people right, begin that plus about the, losing the storyline. Don't forget, he likes the direct stories, and it, it ain't happening. These are not the stories that he wants to see. If you looked at the uh, front page of the New York Times from last night, mm -hmm. it was just awful news for Trump. It was all about I mean, that stupid headline, sure, but it was all about how things are falling apart in Syria, that he's uh, responsible for it, and everybody's upset with him. Mm. Okay. That's good. Man. Yeah. Because they should be. Ah. Well, not everyone is doing what they should be doing. Yeah. This is one not of the problems we have. Okay. I think, uh, all right, time to dive into things, see what's happening, gather up the latest happenings in the last hour, <laughs> what has changed. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, well, we'll have uh, plenty to catch up on once again, I'm sure, by, by Monday. Yeah, Ian Reifowitz is coming for the second part of the show, he so do is. me a favor and say hi okay. to, me, to him from Better me. Better do that now. Hi. All right. And uh, I will uh, uh, talk to you on uh, Monday. Okay. Very good. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be less ranty, you. but uh, uh, no, you know, this, no this stuff I think is important, and, and I just want the Democrats to do a better job with this. I and if you don't to. like Pelosi, support her anyway, because right now the country okay. needs her. All right. Well, we may have very little choice in all of that. That's also true. <laughs> we, we, we've got who we've got, at least for the moment. Okay. Yep. Take care. Very good. Thank you. Do the same. You you go to impeachment <clears throat> with the uh, people you have, not that, the people you wish you had. That's true. Right. And uh, all right. Well, that's you, you can't shuffle the line up too much and not lose a step in the middle of a play like this. Yep. Take okay. care. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And uh, see you on Monday. Let's see. Uh, by way of finishing out the hour here, let me switch over to, I don't know whether to go with the, uh, the latest on the Twitter stuff or go back to head back to, to pocket and see, I forget what is in there by now. There's so much piled on top of everything else. Ah, yes. The, the short hits were, uh, Erdogan throwing Trump's Syria letter in the garbage, <clears throat> but we've covered that. Uh, Hmm. Let's see. Uh, Sondland getting set, uh, I guess, to, to, well, let's see, everybody digesting his previews of his testimony, but I think he's up today. Um, oh, I'll have to mention this, although we won't have time to dive into the story, but <clears throat> if you haven't read the Vanity Fair piece, and I have not read the Vanity Fair piece, you should take a look at it. Maybe it's something we can read through tomorrow, but there's no point in trying to plan ahead like this. Who knows what we're going to be covering tomorrow. <clears throat> but William Cohen, Cohen, does he say Cohen or Cohen? C-O-H-A-N. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, has this piece in Vanity Fair. There is definite hanky-panky going on, and not even that kind of hanky-panky, although we are talking about Trump. The fantastically profitable mystery of the Trump chaos trades. I like the uh, the nomenclature we're hanging in. It's the Trump chaos trades. The president's talk, as you all know, can move markets, and it has, and it's made some futures traders, some futures traders, some mysterious future traders, billions. Did they know what he was going to say before he said it? And that's a natural question to ask. Without uh, getting too far into the details, 
It is essentially a collection of bizarre, maybe, instances uh, in which someone has, been, well, I mean, it may not be the same person each time, but that uh, in, in these several instances, trades being made, in, curiously, always in the last half hour to just a few minutes of trading for the day on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. But time after time, options are being purchased. Uh, is it options or is it, I guess it's futures, futures contracts uh, being purchased uh, in the last minutes of trading that uh, hinging upon activity f controlled by the White House, you know, comments being made, announcements being released are changing the market so dramatically that these last minute trades are turning in profits in some cases in the hundreds of millions and in some cases in the billions of dollars on uh, volatile market activity. And I don't know, I mean, I guess if it's the same person or group of people or that the source of the information is the same, he may be distributing the information uh, you know, more widely, it could be the same person over and over again, but just some incredible trade stories where people are making hundreds of million dollars or billions of dollars on positions that they hold for a matter of minutes. And, uh, well, you know how we are about hard work in this country. I think this is probably part of what the coal miners wanted. They wanted people to be able to turn trades into billion dollar plus profits in the matter of minutes. I think most people, most coal miners are fairly familiar with making that kind of money. Anyway, like I said, it's fairly astonishing and it's uh, not all that long a piece. So, you know, it may be something we can discuss tomorrow. But in case we just don't get to it and things go crazy, this is uh, not directly impeachment related yet until we find out uh, exactly how this information is being distributed and by whom. And if we can finally hang this on somebody and say, uh, it's all Donald Trump Jr. making this money. Well, then we'd have a story. But in the meantime, I'm afraid it might fall through the cracks. Read it and it won't. We'll be right back. Hey, and hold on just a sec. Okay. Welcome back now to the K-Grown in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. Uh, heading into our second hour, as I, as promised, Ian Reifowitz is with us, and he's, he's already here. Uh, how's that? Nice and neat during the break. And, uh, man, well, it's been a while, Ian. How are you doing? I'm doing well, David. Good. It's always okay. fun to be with you. Yes. Well, uh, this was a, a pleasant surprise, so glad we could uh, catch up with you. There's plenty happening. Uh, I don't know where you, I don't know where you think you're going to start on all this. But um, I, 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 I guess we'll throw the door open to just about any uh, approach to any subject today, because uh, there's really no point. As, I, 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 as I've been trying to plan shows and realizing that there's really no point in doing it, because the, the, the news just changes minute by minute. And I, it's very difficult to decide what's the biggest story of the day. And uh, even just right before the break, I wanted to discuss put out there for people to read on their own if necessary the uh, uh vanity fair story about the uh futures trading and the millions billions being made in in bizarre unexplained futures trading in the last couple minutes every once in a while of the trading in chicago mercantile exchange that uh apparently some people are making billions of dollars in last minute trades that uh, don't make a great deal of sense until just after they make their purchases, the president makes some kind of announcement, sometimes bizarre and sometimes not, that changes the direction of the market. And someone mysteriously walks away with billions of dollars time after time. And uh, seems like a story that ordinarily would be a huge and explosive one and a, a headline maker for weeks to come, but probably not in the in the Trump administration, unless we finally find out it's Ivanka and Jared or Don Jr. or someone like that. Uh, but the, it wouldn't the, be Eric. He's not smart enough. 
<laughs> no, right. He's busy stealing money from uh, cancer charities, and that's where his stuff comes from. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess it certainly could be Eric. Uh, someone could be working on his behalf. It would be a big surprise. It could be Baron. He's a very smart kid. Oh, from what yeah. I hear. Uh you know, I mean, I don't know that he's crooked or anything, but it might just be, you know, he's a kid. It could be a prank. I don't know. Billion dollar prank from a Trump. That's, uh, you know, that's kind of the uh, the, the arena in which uh, the family graft operates, you know, at the billion dollar level. I, I, uh, yeah, it would be a uh, it would be a custodial account. So right. we'd have we'd have an adult to blame. So for those of you who are uncomfortable pinning this on Baron, we'll just say uh, it's a custodial account, and uh, maybe Melania's name is on that one. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, when I was a, a minor, I, I signed up for the Columbia Music Group. If you remember, you got thirteen uh, <laughs> yes. uh, set tapes for a penny, but you had to commit to spending a billion dollars over the next however many years. And <laughs> yes, I was a minor. What can I say? Right. And many people walk away from those deals, and Columbia is on the short end of the stick with that. You're supposed to be, I don't know if you have to be 18 to do that or not, but investing a penny, that's a big deal. In for a penny, in for a pound, I guess. Right. See, we could keep going all day with this comedy routine. There's, there's very little point in covering the news. I would say that. Uh, well, uh, let me however, then say, uh, yes. first, again, thank you for having me on. You're uh, welcome. You know, I always, yes, I'm a, it's always a pleasure. Um, if I may just mention to folks, that uh, in addition to my writing on Daily Coast, I do have my still relatively new book out, uh, Tribalization of Politics. Uh, um, the Tribalization of Politics. There's something after that. It's uh, having a blank here for a second. The Tribalization of Politics, How Rush Limbaugh's Race-Baiting Rhetoric on the Obama Presidency Paved the Way for Trump. And it's uh, available on Amazon, on the publisher's website, wherever you, you think you might find it. It's, uh, it's out there for folks. So thanks for giving me a chance to mention that. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a long subtitle. I know it's difficult. I know. You, you wrote it and it's tough to remember. I know. Well, you know, the original subtitle was I've read eight years of Rush Limbaugh show transcripts, so you don't have to. <laughs> well, that's easier. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, actually, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a bit about an op-ed that was in the New York Times. Yes. Uh, I haven't seen it in the print edition yet, but it's been online for, uh, uh, I think, about 48 hours. And uh, it's it's by a friend of mine, a professor at Berkeley Law School named Ian Haney Lopez. Uh, oh, and yeah. it's an absolutely terrific article. And it summarizes the uh, the argument and the research he presents in a new book. So I'm talking about somebody else's book, not my own. See, mm. uh -huh. not all okay. of the self promotion. Uh, and the book is called Merge Left. Uh, and the op ed is absolutely terrific. And, and uh, I you know would encourage you guys to, you know, in the audience to take a look. Merge Left right, is. Um, based on on research that uh, Lopez and some of the folks at, at Demos, which you may have heard of, uh, it's a terrific organization, terrific progressive organization, have done. And it's Merge Left Fusing Race and Class, Winning Elections and Saving America. I mean, and who wouldn't want to win some elections and save some America? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, some America anyway. Some America. And uh, but it's a terrific sort of distillation of what he does in the in, in the book, this op ed piece. You have mentioned uh, this before. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have maybe talked about this before. Yeah, yeah but they've, you know, how they've done this research to show that, you know, you need to talk about Trump's racism and the Rep Republicans racism in order to win over voters. You can't just talk about economic issues, but you can't also just talk about racism. You can't just say Trump's a racist. That's bad. Don't vote for him. You got to connect the two. And that's what their research found was that if you talk about the racism of Republicans as a tool that they use to divide whites and people of color against each other uh, and make the argument that the, the, the reason why they're dividing the, you know, sort of your working class, middle class whites from your people of color is to make sure that they don't come together and, re and, and, and vote out the Republicans who are basically just putting in economic policies to benefit the wealthy, that that's, mm -hmm. that kind of rhetorical strategy uh, works to get more white voters and more voters of color than either a racism is bad only approach or and let's talk about economics only approach and you got to connect okay. the two and so this wonderful piece in the new york times is hopefully getting wide play and uh, professor lopez's book is absolutely terrific and, and it's important because obviously we're running an election campaign and you know he and i have talked about this we've seen elizabeth warren in particular use this kind of rhetoric uh, not so much in the debate the other night unfortunately but when she talks um uh, in general, she's she's used this kind of rhetoric before. And I also reviewed the Merch Left book on Daily Coast a couple of weeks ago. People might have seen that. So, oh, yeah, um, okay. 
certainly interesting stuff. And I was looking for it in the debate the other night. And I was a little disappointed it didn't come up. But it's also harder to do yeah. in a debate context than in a you know in a in a speech where you making your own you know making your own subject. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to bring the conversation around to that in in one minute or less. I'm sure. Um, Although, you know, it is at the heart of, of things. It does come up from time to time, but you, it's it's also not just you. It's 12 other people out there driving things, plus moderators. Uh, yeah, maybe not the best context for for bringing it up. But, uh, okay, I'll have to – I will uh, find a link, too, also for your review of, of the book. But anybody who wants to take a look at this op-ed um, – uh, if you just can't wait, of course, how to beat Trump at his own game. And I guess it's in the online uh, edition, as you mentioned. So you might not find it in print just yet, but I'll have a link for everybody in the uh, afternoon summary. So no one will miss out on this. Yeah, maybe it'll be in the Sunday uh, in the Sunday print because hmm. they usually gather a lot into the Sunday review section. OK. Uh, all right. Well, let's see. Uh, is there anything that uh, in particular that needs to be drawn out of the the op-ed, the best nuggets of it, uh, go through this or? Oh, well, if, if you, uh, uh, I mean, I think we kind of already did it. But yeah. I think the most interesting thing for me is that he's not just making this stuff up and he's not just saying, wouldn't it be great if they, they've done the data, they've okay, done the yeah, research, right. they've, they've done focus groups, they presented, you know, he talks about how they presented like nine different messages and, you know, rate, you know, the race only, the class only, and then what he calls the race class fused message and. And and what was really interesting was that different demographic groups responded sort of, pers- you know, these persuadable voters uh, as well, you know, uh, as well as Democratic mm-hmm. base voters, as well as, you know, white, black, Hispanic, all the different, you know, you know, the different groups that they broke it down into. To me, the more the most interesting thing was that you might have expected might have expected the, the voters of color and maybe the black voters in particular to say, no, we, we really need we, we really respond better to this race only message, ra- you know, racial justice only message. But they didn't. Mm-hmm. And, and what Lopez found was that that especially African-American voters liked a message that convinced them, the African-American voters, that white voters would have an interest in fighting racism. Right. Because they're the African-American voters in particular, and they're not sort of pie in the sky. They have some experience with, you know, you know, uh, racism, but also the difficult, you know, difficulty of convincing, let's say, convincing white white voters or some white voters to join them. And so I, the article talked about how they um, were, I guess you could say, responded positively to the notion that that uh, you were going to specifically convince whites that that fighting racism would help them, would help the whites. Yeah. All right. That, that helped convince black voters that white voters would join on, would join in. It was that a very sort of strategic sense. thing, and, yeah. it, and it does make sense. But I thought it was really fascinating that the data showed that, that hmm. Lopez's hmm. data showed that. Okay, so not just a guess. I mean, it would be a pretty good guess, certainly. But uh, it, it makes it also makes sense that there would be data to back it up. Uh, obviously, I think uh, probably asking most voters of color that question, they're savvy enough to realize that yeah, a lot of you know, there are a lot of people out there who could be good white allies, but, you know, the best way to solidify that support is to make it clear that there's a benefit there for them, too. It's not right. uh, not an unreasonable conclusion. And uh, I, I guess everybody the data says uh, the majority think exactly that. Excellent. Right. OK, got it. Good. OK, <laughs> well, well, that's nice. done. <laughs> Well, we got, we got, we got 49 more minutes. Yeah, right. Well, what else have we got on the table here? I'm taking a look through your latest diaries to see uh, what you've been discussing, or maybe you just want to uh, uh, certainly plenty of news to come through. Uh, sure. What, what I'm, I'm game. You know, yeah. let's, let's talk about the news. What have you, oh. you know, what, what, have, what have you got left on your plate oh, for today? Well, that's all, all, I mean, any number of directions. I don't know whether to go with the, uh, the, the foreign policy stuff and continue on with the, for instance, uh, I don't know, I guess there's not much analysis necessarily to do with, say, Trump's letter to Erdogan. Oh, good Lord. Got thrown in the trash. And that, uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I, I am amazed that this is, I think, as I said, this is the second time in a week's time that the press has been forced to ask whether letters from the White House were genuine or whether they were all being pranked by, you know, Sasha Baron Cohen or something like that. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know what else to take away from it other than 
and at this point it almost seems useless, superfluous to, to point out to people, for instance, anybody who might have been a Trump supporter, we were all promised that American prestige was somehow, which had somehow been damaged in their mind, was going to be restored. And, well, you know, it seems to be the opposite to this point. And uh, I don't know if there's any more point to be extracted from that. Um, uh, and uh, in the middle of the... In the middle of last week, we had the the letter, although there is the additional weirdness of the letter from the White House counsel's office that Trump dictated, apparently, and somehow insisted that uh, one of the attorneys there actually sign it under their name, which, of course, calls into question every everything that comes under their signature, court filings, letters, etc. Um, but... Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, we have Lindsey Graham, who appears to be trying to distance himself from the foreign policy aspect, is at the same time apparently collecting names on or attempting to collect signatures on on a letter from Republicans in the Senate, just simply stating that, look, this is a dead letter and we will not vote to convict Donald Trump in an impeachment proceeding no matter what evidence you have to show us of what crimes. Uh, and and I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I guess at some point I, I worry that uh, all the strategizing about how to take this on um, might not take into account the, the, the bizarre moment in history we're actually experiencing where uh, an entire major political party is just saying, I'm sorry, logic and the law do not apply here. And uh, I don't know how well we strategize for things like that. I, I guess we have to rely on uh, the American voter being able to understand that they're through the looking glass with Republicans. And uh, sometimes that that's not heartening. <laughs> no, and, you know, and, and I, I liked you know, that you gave them a little bit of credit in what was going through their mind, because what I was thinking was going through their mind was just la, 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 la. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah. Uh, but, you well, know, I think so. It also reminded me that during the debate the other night, um, I think it was Cory Booker. I, I could, I, one of the Democrats, I think it was in the Senate, was asked, well, you know, you've already said that you're you, you know, you've already given your your stance on on impeachment. And, and does that make you biased if you have to sit for a trial? Well, here's yeah. here's Lindsey Graham and his party literally signing a letter of their revealing their bias, which is that that their letter is saying we're not going to listen to the evidence. We already have our conclusion. But yet it's the Democratic senator on the debate stage who's asked whether he's bi you know biased, mm, whatever bias. that means or not. I mean, look, you're, you're you're making this case for history. You're not making this case only because you think it might get Donald Trump removed from office. You're making, and I, and I, and I think yeah, I also heard this on the debate mark. stage too. Um, you're making this case for the next president and the next president and the next president after that. I think it was Warren who said that to set out the limits of what presidents can get away with. And yes, even if Donald Trump is impeached, but not removed, he can say to himself that he quote unquote got away with it. But I don't think future presidents are going to feel like he got away with it or at least mm -hmm. not. They, yeah. they won't have gotten, you know, he will have gotten away with it a lot more if we don't impeach him because he's not going to get convicted. Uh, at this point, um, the impeachment has to the inquiry has to move forward. Uh, I personally don't see how with the evidence that's already been presented just on you, just on Ukraine, that he's not impeached. Uh, and then, you know, we'll see where the Senate goes. The Senate. Look, the Senate Republicans are going to go where the polls are. You got 51, 52 percent now in a couple of polls in favor of removal, not just impeachment, but removal. If that number starts getting closer to 60, you will see mm. Republicans vote to remove. Um, maybe not all of them, certainly, and maybe not those in the no. most uh, conservative states. But uh, 60 is a magic number in the polling. Mm. Uh, and if even if he survives the is the, the conviction vote. But let's say five or six or seven Republicans vote with Democrats. That's a pretty big yeah. statement, uh, a, a huge statement. In fact, I don't believe any Democrats voted to convict Bill Clinton, which I, I, I don't remember that, but I'm 99 percent sure. Uh, if you want to go back to Andrew Johnson, if that is relevant, I believe it was only Republicans who you know voted to, to convict Andrew Johnson. I, I don't yeah. I you know, having 
people from your own party vote to convict and remove you from office, that's a bad stain. And if yes. the evidence is there and you get 60 percent supportive, you're going to see some people. You're going to see Romney, hopefully. Uh, I I would be mm. surprised if, if you didn't see Susan Collins. And I'm not talking about for, in this for most of these people that it'll be a matter of principle. It'll be a matter of saving their own hide. Their whole support for Trump all this time is about saving their own hide. Uh, I think it was Jeff Flake That's who true. said about a, a week or two ago that if you had a secret vote in the Senate, you'd have 30 Republicans vote to convict right now. So, you know, that that's what we're getting at. This is about uh, laying down a marker. Uh, and it's not just the Ukraine stuff. I mean, look, look at what we saw yesterday just from, you know, the the documents that ProPublica has reviewed, which you may have already talked about, oh, we his, ta- you know, his tax documents that in 2017, after he was already president, <laughs> he's he's, yeah. he's running he's running two sets of books, you know, like like a, um, you know, like a, a regular mafia boss. You know, you know, two, two sets yeah. of books, one for the one for Deutsche Bank to show he's profitable and one for the tax man to show he's not profitable so that he can screw the rest of us by underpaying his taxes. Yes, that makes and, me smart. And you talked about signatures. Well, he signed those documents. His name is on those documents. He couldn't get a White House lawyer to do it because there's his private, you know, his financial yeah, returns wait, and, his, man, and his, do, you know, his business documents. I mean, that's those are crimes. People, regular people, the people wearing the red MAGA hats. They would go to jail if they had a small business or a large business that kept two sets of books. People can relate to that. People can understand that. That's going in the that should go in the impeachment referral as well. If you know if there's time for it. Um, My God, I mean, you know, we've said this a thousand times already, but it's it's bears repeating again. We've never seen anything like this. And I pray we never see anything like this again from a president. I sure as hell hope that the people who voted for Donald Trump have learned something something from this well hmm, yeah hmm. some some hopefully have have done that i'm sure there have, there's millions of them so there have to be some who have learned something and hey we see that reported every once in a while in the papers farmers who are suffering under the tariff regimes um others uh, who are embarrassed by foreign policy we saw comments in the last couple of days from uh, i i guess uh, folks serving in the military saying uh, the, the quote that stuck with me this is the first time I've been ashamed of my country uh, since whenever or maybe forever in their entire lifetime. But the withdrawal from Syria prompting this. So I guess there's bits and pieces of that all around. And then then there are others who uh, I, I'm sure are holding on to those MAGA hats and say, no, that's just what he said. His Failure to pay taxes is what makes him smart. I would do the same or who believe that somehow, um, you know, uh, if I were caught keeping two sets of books, I would be pardoned because the president knows me from 4chan or whatever. <laughs> I make the best memes. There's no way that he would be willing to let me go to jail uh, since it would be so embarrassing to him. And I don't know. I mean, I guess there's some basis for their continuing to believe it in some circles, considering how far down into online obscurity this White House, somebody somewhere, not certainly not Trump doing it, but somebody somewhere in the apparatus is reaching down to elevate people like this and having these uh, White House conferences on, uh, I forget exactly what they styled it, but they were bringing all sorts of uh, bloggers and meme creators, et cetera, to uh, some sort of alternative uh, communications conference and the, the, the assemblage of people that they put together was really rather remarkable. That was, I think, where the last time they put them all together out in the Rose Garden and the fight nearly broke out between Sebastian Gorka and the uh, the correspondent from Playboy, I think. Uh, and they ended up revoking his press passes, etc., and then sending Sebastian Gorka overseas somehow with some, <clears throat> I don't know what the reasoning was, and we never did get a good report exactly what he was doing in, in Rome when he went o- over with Mike Pompeo, I think. They never really distanced themselves from them. I'm sure that there are people who uh, roll their eyes and thought the same thing whenever President Obama would have liberal bloggers or, or YouTubers and meet, you know come to the White House for receptions. But it was never under the guise of their setting policy. That's for sure. Right. And of course, never any fistfights is that I can remember. 
uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess I I pray right along with you there that this never happens again. Um, and and to connect it to one of your earlier points, I guess then it it will make a difference if at some point, even if you garner just a few Republican votes in favor of both impeachment and then uh, for removal, even if it is ultimately unsuccessful and uh, weighing it against the rest of history. It's it's true. We don't do this very often, but I guess basic fact is even when presidents have deserved it, we've never removed a president from office, but in all likelihood, Trump will come closer to that possibility than anyone else. And that ought to count for something because he's certainly crazier than anyone else. Well, yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, I, I just, I'm just left with this sense of, of, um, I don't, and it's not even hope. Just, you know, I, I keep thinking, you know, I, I almost wrote a column, a, a post mm-hmm. last, for last Sunday called, Oh, Mitt Romney, where art thou? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> now he, now that he's under attack by Club for Growth, you might have been onto something. Oh, maybe, Yeah. I mean, you know, where where are the principles? But but, you know, it, it is it is important to, to to think about picking off a few people and not just in the Senate, but in terms of, of the voters out there. I mean, you know, you had Greg on earlier. I, I, I love Greg's um, uh, pundit roundups and, and he mm-hmm. makes his views known in a subtle way throughout. And he's very good about, I think, recognizing that it's important to appeal to those uh, whether you, whether they're non-voters or possible Trump voters or whatever, you know, so in the middle or whatever, you, in the middle of the political spectrum, appeal to them, appeal to enough of them that you can add to your vote totals, but while recognizing that you don't, you know, that, there, that most of the, maybe most of the Trump voters are lost cause, but that there are, you know, those people who can be brought back, let's say the Obama Trump voters. Um, and, and Greg usually phrases this in a much more eloquent way than I'm doing right now. But, uh, you know, he, he's right. Right. I mean, there's certainly no reason why we can't get back. Uh, people who voted for Obama and then voted for Trump while with and, and I guess this connects to what we were talking about at the beginning with Lopez's book with a message that also excites the base, mm-hmm. excites our progressive base. Um, we're not going to go out there and say, yeah, we agree with Trump about illegal immigrants. Vote for us. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. And that's I would I wouldn't stand for a party that voted for that either. Um, but there are ways to um, to talk that are not that are that are that emphasize our progressive values, but that don't alienate those um, people who might want to vote for us, but uh, who, who could be, uh, you know, who could be persuaded. Uh, and we're talking about uh moving 10,000 votes here and 10,000 votes there, we can do that by both adding to the base and by drawing from the middle. And I think we have to do both of those things because, you you know, on its own, it's not enough. Neither of those on its own is enough to um, to guarantee the kind of vote total that we need to A, win the Electoral College, B, deliver a Senate majority. And I mean, we, we got to have a Senate majority if we're going to be able to do things like confirm judges, you know, uh, it's it's so important. Um, and so I, I, you know, yeah, if your listeners haven't been reading their Greg Dworkin little commentaries, uh, they're they're really well, uh, well formed. So I'll, I'll give it uh, some some praise to my colleague, Greg. <laughs> OK, I'm sure he'd be willing to accept that. Thank you. Uh, so we'll say thanks on his behalf. Oh, yes. And he did. He did uh, insist that I that I that I pass on his his greetings and to say hi. And I usually say pro forma. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And then, then we start talking and I always forget to do it. So, I mean, that doesn't make, it's not going to change the direction of the conversation, but hi, <laughs> there you are. Good. good. Uh, I'm so glad he'll to be make, listening to. We go beyond pro forma. Yes. And we can go right from pro forma straight to quid pro quo. <laughs> right. Uh, all the Latin. Well, as you know, our relationship with the, uh, the Italians goes back to ancient Rome we learned from the president yesterday i am surprised he didn't uh, i i had was thinking about placing a small bet on whether or not he would say something outrageous talk about pizza or say that's a spicy meat the ball or something like that while the italians were here but <clears throat> you and i are old enough to remember that yeah right as not everybody is going to get that but uh no he managed to avoid that but instead uh talked about our relationship with ancient rome which i guess he read in the same history book wherein the continental army took over the airports 
I, I don't know. I'm not certain where that comes from. It's not important, I guess, but uh, uh, just another. Uh, well, I guess if people who are logging instances of cognitive decline may. Uh, Maybe that's the same book them. where Napoleon saved the Kurds. Yes, right. And he's he's one of the candidates for doing that. That's I right. thought that in one of his uh, statements as well. It's uh, it's hard to tell. With the, I'm sure he's he was busy like the Continental Army ramming the ramparts and doing whatever they have to do to win well, whatever mention, conflict they're involved in. Did he this. mention his spiritual forefather, Caligula? <laughs> no, that he didn't do, although that's probably his impression of the Roman Empire. I saw that movie. It's one of my favorites. Sadly, I did too. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, many people did. We were all roped into it. There's a lot of hype around it. Uh, he owns it probably on DVD, and that may be a difference between him and you, but if not, uh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be right back in two minutes to continue the discussion, and uh, stay tuned for yet more. We'll see if we can straighten out what's next. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the K-Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Okay, we'll try and keep on schedule for you, Ian. But uh, uh, let's see. The um, Oh, look, we got a note here from somebody who remembers the spicy meatball line. Okay, so that's good news. Uh, we're not all that old, but uh, yeah, I just I guess related to that. I just happened to see go by on Twitter. Marcos was retweeting uh, somebody's look at photos. I was wondering who this person was. Um, I, I saw her in these pictures. So the translator that they brought in for the visit of the Italian president, uh, who, you know, not surprisingly is giving some disbelieving looks, you know, over Trump's shoulder here. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, did this happen? I, I don't even recall. I, I don't know whether this person is exaggerating or not, but the, the, the photos seem to tell, I'll have to retweet this thing. So if the live listeners can find this thing, um, but the, the, the commentary here is the look of the White House Italian translator as Trump says, and I don't, I didn't hear him say this. Did he say, did he refer to the president of, of Italy as President Mozzarella? That can't be true. Oh, no. Is that real? Uh, I hope not. I don't know. What, what is the president's name? I don't know the president of Italy offhand, but I hope it doesn't begin with an M and sound anything like that. I can see his face. He's an older guy in his 80s and he has a long name. Hold on. <laughs> I hope that's nothing. I, I hope that's a joke. Who am I reading here? Danny Keats. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. His name is Sergio Mattarella. M a t t a r e l l a. Oh my God! Did he do this? I I, I have to tell you, you know, <laughs> that's anybody, an easy mistake to make for Trump. Easy mistake. Anybody who didn't put a bet on him calling the president <laughs> really Mattarella was a fool. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, I was, you know, I I had no idea what the name of the Italian president was, but I couldn't believe that that was real. If the Onion had tweeted that, I, you know, I'd know what was going on. But the look on the White House translator's face, I guess you can imagine what it would look like when he says President Mozzarella and says that U.S. and Italy have been allies since ancient Rome. Uh, that part I heard about. Uh, well, that's when the George Washington administration <laughs> began, right? <laughs> right, yeah. It's a, all old. That means ancient. And uh, it, I guess it all overlaps. Uh, whatever. It, for Trump, it happened before uh, me. So it, there's two eras in history, BT and then me. So right. I guess that's... Well, you can imagine what the look on the Italian translator's face is like, you know, how do I get out of here? 
I can't believe he just said that. Can I exit? I guess she's a American uh, State Department employee, but uh, maybe not today. You should check on that. All right. Well, it's impressive that she resisted putting her palm to her forehead. Right. You know, I mean, it's like it's like you mentioned with the letter. Like you don't think that that letter could be real, but yet it was real. I just came across um, a comment from the Kremlin about the the Trump yeah. letter to, to the Turkish president. Yes. Quote, quote, you don't often encounter such language in correspondence between heads of state. <laughs> it's a highly unusual letter. End quote. That's, That's very from diplomatic. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov. Well, they are practiced. That's a, it's awfully diplomatic. They certainly could have gone to town on that one. Uh, uh, I see another comment here. <laughs> this is somebody with video of the translator. The White House translator is me watching the Jaguars last Sunday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, uh, uh, the disbelief. Uh, yes, the Russians have had uh, plenty of opportunity in the last couple of days. I understand that uh, state television is... Uh, is really enjoying the opportunity to air propaganda videos of uh, their correspondence, the RT correspondence broadcasting from inside uh, military fortifications positions immediately or just recently abandoned by American troops now occupied by, by Russian troops. It's doing wonders for our international prestige. We're no longer a laughing stock, as Trump would tell us. So <clears throat> we're, no, we're no longer a laughing stock. Yes. We're the laughing stock. <laughs> That's it. We're not just one among many. American exceptionalism, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. We are the top laughing stock. Well, there's another I saw, you know, um, on Russian uh, Russian state TV. Uh, you've got uh, this comment about the Kurdish Syrian Trump situation. This is from uh, TV host Dmitry Kiselov. The Kurds themselves again picked the wrong patron. The United States, of course, is an unreliable partner. I mean, it, it, there's just no sugarcoating yeah, how bad that right. is. And and they, and he's not wrong. As you know, even even if Russian state news sometimes has fake news, yeah, that ain't fake. That seems real enough. Uh, just thinking about, well, I'll have to ask all the people from Charlottesville who marched chanting, Russia is our friend. We'll just have to ask them whether they thought that was a friendly comment or not. But mm. these, it has the virtue of being true. So they could stand by that. Yeah, there, there, there rarely has uh, a few billion dollars, excuse me, a few million dollars been better invested by one government than the few million Russia spent helping Trump get elected. Yeah, well, it's a big return on that. And uh, well, that was the, the upshot of yesterday's meeting uh, that started off the coverage this morning. The uh, House Democrats walking out of their meeting that they were and even this is of mysterious provenance, how this meeting came about. They, uh, <clears throat> after it broke up, uh, the the Democrats just said, well, we were summoned to the White House to discuss Syria. So we went and Trump, I guess, having had the meeting blow up in his face, says that he doesn't know how it started either. They wanted to come. So they asked me so another one of those. They were calling begging me stories. I'm sure oh. tears streaming down their face as well. Uh, well, but who wouldn't who wouldn't beg for a meeting? with Yeah, Donald? right. And everyone wants to go to the, the Trump White House. Uh, but yeah, that the, the all roads lead to Putin statement seems to have set him off. But uh, at least at least now we know Nancy Pelosi is 100 percent clear on that. If there was ever any question about what she thought the relationship between them was. But uh, a lot of people have been noting this and a lot of people even uh, discussing uh, the Helsinki meeting between the two of them that I guess now in looking back on the photos of them, uh, uh, Putin appears to be holding a, a checklist essentially of, of his, his wish list for foreign policies. If I could do anything, I would wish that the, the United States would surrender on the following points. And apparently almost everything that's happened in the last couple of months since uh, is listed on there and, and he's completed it all. Uh, Probably the most far-fetched at the time was getting the United States to withdraw from Syria because no one believed that was a realistic possibility. But he, he has somehow talked Donald Trump into it. I guess all you got to do is call him on the phone. Yeah, especially you know, just call him on the phone, you know, right after uh, he, he's been watching Fox, Fox and Friends or 
Uh, really, yeah. I guess anytime he's awake or, you know, he, there's never a bad time to get to get him to do something stupid. Uh, that's true. <laughs> as long as he's awake, it can be done. Uh. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. That, that I, I read that when that right before the call with Erdogan, that his reefers or whatever said, make sure that you make it clear to Erdogan that he that his troops can't cross the Turkish border into Syria. Like, I mean, they literally told him that and mm-hmm. he did the exact opposite. Yeah. Well, like I uh, do not congratulate Cole. Uh, for Putin's re-election. It's the one note they gave him. Do not congratulate. First thing out of his mouth, congratulations. Uh, there's been plenty of reporting on that, too, and it was reiterated of late that he, uh, Trump, um, hates to be briefed ahead of time. He, he, he thinks most of his briefers are wrong. He thinks his gut is more trustworthy than foreign policy professionals. But in addition, he makes a point of not making a lot of these calls from the Oval Office where they can be on hand to help him, but rather rolling out of bed, or maybe not even leaving the bed, making these calls uh, first thing in the morning for him, 9 a.m., which is incredible as president of the United States, making them from the residence where almost no one can be on hand to help him. And he throws out notes. Of course, they've given him briefings. They've even whittled the briefings down to note cards with one point each, and no more than three cards, and he still throws them out. Uh, and, and <clears throat> by the way, continues to to tear them up and throw them into the burn bag, which is, again, itself a violation of the Presidential Records Act, and uh, White House employees are having to spend... We're paying people to fish the notes out of the burn bag and tape them back together and send them to the archives. It's going to be an incredible thing one day when historians like you there's a project for you go back and to the archives and to the donald trump archives and just document how much of it is covered in scotch tape <laughs> that alone is a book oh my god it's certainly uh it just reminds me of, it just reminds me of the scene from animal house when the, the guys are going through the garbage looking for the, <laughs> the graph of the psych exam <laughs> yes. that's gonna be historian right oh, no, i've got gonna, it that's trump staffers now yeah Right. Oh my God! Dumpster diving to find these things. Uh, well, people laugh, cry, right? Yeah, I, I mean, there's no keeping up with, uh, as you were mentioning, uh, you know, the, the number of things that should be part of the impeachment uh, counts. The, but no matter how we do it, there's going to be so much that's left out that that likewise, just as Elizabeth Warren was saying, needs to be uh, pointed out, delineated, and 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 condemned for history so that uh, there's no mistaking that these are things that will get you in trouble. And hopefully if, if we get lucky and all future presidents are, you know, cognitively capable and were, we elect people who are worried about how they perform in the job. And I guess that's now a big question mark. Uh, then yeah, that's a, it's one of the important points for impeachment is it, Hopefully, we'll be electing people who will know. Now, impeachment is not something I want to risk. Uh, it's not a position I want to be in. And these things will cause that, and I will therefore not do them. Uh, when I advocated for the impeachment of George W. Bush on the same basis, I admit it never really entered my consideration that there might be a president, and real soon, who would literally not care about or understand any of those things and whose metric for the permissibility of his actions was, am I in jail now? And if not, this is something that the president has the right to do. I I thought of that as a joke, as a, as a metric for Bush and Cheney, but, but I do think they worried about being on trial and I'm not certain that Trump does. Now, if Trump was listening to you, the only thing he would he would be worried about is that you were trying to impose the metric system on us. <laughs> That's probably true. Did he just say metric? That's wrong. I can't have yeah, that. Metric bad. <laughs> I'm not certain what bothers him about it, but yeah, I guess he's just an old timey guy. All right, man. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, he is crazy. We do have that. I don't think there's anything else uh, completely out of bounds happening at the moment. I think everybody is. Uh, maybe that Gordon Sondland's testimony is beginning or already underway. I'm not certain what the time was. I think things have slowed down a little bit 
from there, which might give us a chance to look back at some of the other things you've been writing about recently. Sure. Um, and uh, I felt like we didn't get enough. Uh, well, Greg gave us a good recap of um, what had happened in the debate last time around, although debate something I tend to not watch, but I thought maybe we could get a few minutes of discussion on what you took away from there. Um, back to back to the messaging of regular dem democratic electoral politics, because that still remains an important topic, even as the current president of the United States disintegrates before our very eyes. Um, your so again, your takeaway from the debates. I also have, uh, as we discussed earlier, one of your recent essays about uh, democratic messaging and and campaign pitch of uh, "We'll cut your taxes and guarantee your health care." How's that for a democratic campaign pitch? Sounds like a pretty good one, at least uh, primary time. And is it something that carry? I assume carries over. Uh, in general election too, but how does it work versus a a, a blathering idiot who says that uh, all Democrats are mentally ill or something like that? Right. I mean, it really is more of a general election message. Uh, it 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 built out of uh, the 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 post came out of what I had been reading um, regarding uh, taxes. You know, mm -hmm. there had been some data that came out last week, which I think was discussed certainly on the site about how the top 400 families are paying a, in 2018 paid a lower tax rate than any other cohort, including the bottom 10 percent, which is crazy. Obviously, if you think about that, that the, yeah. the top 400 families are going to are paying less in taxes to the government at the when you combine federal, state, local payroll taxes, et cetera, than the people at the very bottom. Yeah, I and mean, so, nightmare. I mean, it's out, outrageous. And so uh, what the, uh, the the two economists who presented this data put together a, you know, a chart of their own that said, look, why don't we just re return taxes to the, the, the uh, in terms of who pays what to the way there were in, in, in 1950. And they, they did have one caveat, which is that they were, they were including what we, what Americans pay for healthcare in taxes, because these, they're saying, look, healthcare is basically a tax. And, you know, if we're going to have real tax reform and healthcare reform, then Healthcare premiums might, you know, well end up being part of your tax burden di directly. But even if it's not now, it really is indirectly. So to make an apples to apples comparison. And so they okay. they, they 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 rejiggered uh, their proposal rejiggers the tax rates for where they should be for, based on 1950s rate, uh, uh, state, local, uh, et cetera, payroll, uh -huh. et cetera. And what they saw was that if you did that, the bottom 95 percent of households would actually have a tax cut versus where they are now. And it would only be people in the, you know, the next couple of percent would have a slight increase in the, and the major increases would really only come among, uh, it, for families, not even in the top 1%, but, but in the top sliver of the top 1%, they would see fairly, you know, it, it, decent increases, but that would only return their tax rate to the rate that they paid in the 50s. And as I said, this was back when, America was great again, you know, or back, back when America was I, great. So I guess that's the first greatness. Right, sure. <laughs> exactly. So making America great again by returning the tax rates to the 50s mm -hmm. level um, would, own, would 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 uh, still be uh, consistent with a cut for 95 percent of families. And so de if Democrats said, look, we're going to have this new tax code and here's how it's going to work. Your taxes, you are going to go down. And, and there's no reason why we can't say you, because. Republicans all the time talk about what they're going to do for you, but they don't mean every single person in America. And we'd be right. a lot closer to 100 percent than they would. You know, when he when, when Trump says, you know, we're going to keep you safer by getting rid of illegal immigrants. That's wrong on a million levels. But one of the ways it's wrong is that it's not making people safer. If we said we're going to cut your taxes and we mean it for 95 percent of the people. Well, that's a pretty reasonable way of saying your taxes. After all, if the people in the top one percent want to still vote for us, even if we're not going to cut their taxes, then great. We're happy to have their votes. Um, and then guaranteeing their health care. Obviously, we're going to guarantee the protections that are in Obamacare and we're going to push to enhance those protections through some kind of expanded either public option or Medicare for all. Uh, but either way, we're going to you know, we're going to guarantee your access to health care in and Trump won't because Trump wants to uh, to repeal Obamacare, repeal the Affordable Care Act and put nothing in its place or something even worse. So we can go out there and say, look, 
What are we going to do for you, American, average American person? We're going to guarantee your health care. We're going to cut your taxes. We really are. And we're going to pay for it by raising the taxes of the people at the very top, people who are paying far less than they used to pay back when America was great. That's a very 30-second message that will resonate to people. And we can go into a lot of other specifics about a lot of other issues. Uh, but you need a pitch that's going to grab people's attention. And talking about cutting middle class taxes and guaranteeing health care is something that will grab people and they will listen to what comes next. Yeah, I mean, well, certainly a compelling uh, a compelling uh, offer. And I mean, I guess you, if nothing else, you would listen, even if you're skeptical, you'd listen to what comes next. How could you possibly do that? That's the sort of thing that I think for a long time we were trained to believe was impossible but uh, then again, we were probably also trained to believe that it was impossible that billionaires were paying less taxes than regular working people. And that turned out to be true. So, uh, you know, and uh, I guess once you're if you're if the door's open for that, then I suppose, yeah, well, when you when you do spend a little bit of time explaining it and say, yeah, well, so, someone's taxes are going to go up and it's the people whose taxes should be going up and there's enough there to actually pay for both the improvements in access to health care and health care coverage and lower taxes for you, oh, that would be that would be rather appealing if you could back it up that way. I did see the other day, speaking of the uh, that weird historical threshold that we've crossed here with the inversion of the of the tax tables really. Uh I think it was the, it was New York Times had had the this really interesting uh, dynamic uh, uh, representation, a graphic representation that they showed uh, the taxation levels over the last I think forty something years for the for the top. Well, they had a graph, you know, from the bottom of the tax ladder up to the top rungs, and you could see just how. Over time, how what a precipitous dive the top tax rate had taken, and not even going back to the fifties, I think even just forty years or so, back to the eighties would be even back to the eighties tax rates would probably pay for this. Right. I mean, the you know, also the Trump tax, you know, the, what I called the the Trump millionaires tax cut, mm -hmm. that was what pushed the the rate of the top four hundred below the the rate of the bottom ten percent. Mm. Uh, that that, you know, it was getting closer. It was, you know, wasn't too far off. But but his tax cuts were so skewed for the for the richest that uh, that's what put it, you know, pushed it over the finish line, so to speak. And so and then again, that's part of the pitch. That's, you know, our, we're going to guarantee your health care. We're going to cut your taxes. And look what Trump has done in his first term. Mm -hmm. He's raised. Uh, he's uh, excuse me. He's cut taxes almost exclusively for for billionaires and millionaires lied to you about how that was going to work. And has borrowed money from your kids and grandkids to pay for it. Yeah. So part of what we're going to do is undo his tax, uh, his tax scheme, um, and make the tax code again closer to what it was when America was great. Yeah. That how, that's if you how believe that. yeah. he would make America great again compared to how he says he's going to, but really isn't. Hmm. All right. Well, we can hold him to account for that. And I guess, uh, yeah, another one of those things that just everybody, uh, well. People who, who had doubts about Trump initially uh, probably believed at some level, even if they didn't think it could possibly come to pass, that uh, I guess if you left it up to Trump, you know, he would, in fact, end up cutting his own taxes, if he even pays any, or, or the taxes for rich his rich friends, and, and uh, if not leave us out of it, might even actually raise taxes for the rest of us. It just it seemed impossibly stupid. Uh but the data is what it is. It happened. So, yeah, it's uh, difficult to believe that uh, another area where you hope that Trump supporters would have learned something, except, well, some of them probably became Trump supporters in the hopes that that would happen and, and are satisfied customers. I guess there's that. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, there, there are <laughs> not very many of them, though. Thank no. It's, well, it's, and there, there are not very many of them who are satisfied uh, customers based on actual facts oh. versus uh, perceptions and lies. Yes. But th those who are, they're the people in that top 400 households uh, and, you know, maybe just below that level 
they are the ones who have benefited. I mean, you know, you remember how yeah, he was yeah. out there talking about how this was going to this tax plan was going to result in, in in raises for workers and all the data has come in to demonstrate that it really has barely, you know, there's no evidence that it, it's helped workers uh, um, earn at higher incomes. You know, the, the, this tax scheme has helped workers earn higher incomes that almost all of the money that was, went to corporations went into the either, the, you know, the pockets of the executives through, uh, you know, high, uh, essentially just higher profits mm. or through stock buybacks. It went to shareholders. And as we know, most, I believe it's something like uh, 84 percent of stock is held by people in the top 10 percent of households. And uh, Paul Krugman had a great breakdown showing that, that a, you know, a, a, a good number, I think a good chunk, maybe like a, a I don't remember, a quarter or a third of the stock value of the stock market is held by foreigners. So, again, when stock buybacks hit or that a third, you know, that you know, non-U.S. citizens get, got about a third of the benefit of the stock buybacks hmm. and, and the stock buybacks went through the roof after the tax, the ta- Trump tax plan went through. So it's not helping. He's lying. Yes. But, you know, we got to break through. Um, we're not going to break through and convince 100 percent of his voters. We don't need to. No. Even if we convince 5 percent of his voters, he's finished. If we convince 3 percent of his voters, he's probably finished. Yeah. I mean, if things were to come out the same way or uh, votes distributed the same way, yeah, that would that would probably do it. Uh, yeah. Those who are genuinely satisfied customers, as you said, we're only talking about 400 households here. And probably, by the way, they live in uh, largely in New York and California and their votes won't count. But right. OK. Uh, but they'll be spending plenty of money elsewhere for secret Facebook ads to convince the uh, steel workers whose plants closed that their plants are open again somehow. I don't know how, if it works, it works. And I guess there's no helping those folks. But all right. Well, well, well we can. Yes. Uh, for the rest of the world, it actually evaluates some data, if not, uh, it doesn't consume it at the same rate that we do. Uh, it, it, people will uh, – it should register with some of them and it doesn't have to register with a, a great number of them. Uh, and there will still be people who cling to, well, uh, you know, I got screwed, but he tells it the way it is, I suppose, as a possibility. He keeps having rallies and they, they, they do populate those rallies, uh, even if they lie about the numbers. So, okay, well, some number of people will be, uh, terribly disappointed. And I guess, uh, ne- next we have to worry about whether or not, the whether Facebook can convince them to pick up arms and uh, and and prosecute a civil war, or whether they just want to watch something good on television after the election is over, <laughs> we will see. All right. Well, uh, man, there's there's still lots happening. Uh, but thank you for coming by today, Ian. I appreciate it. As I know the the news takes us in odd directions, but it's always it's fun. Take you a little bit out of the. Uh, historical analysis and and uh, the element that we usually uh, are, are analyzing when you're on when we're talking about your your books or your latest essays. But it's great to reflect on the day's news, even the most bizarre news, with you as always. Thanks yes, as by. always, I, it's 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 fun and it's uh, a pleasure to be here and be with your audience as oh, well. Thanks so much. Thanks for thanks for coming by. Thanks for the offer. Always good to hear from you anytime. Of course, anything strikes you as or out of the ordinary or bizarre or just something fun to talk about. You're always always welcome to come by unannounced as well. Appreciate it. But it's always great when we can sell the program with a, a teaser that you'll be on too. So thanks a lot. Thanks. Oh, and again, yes, you can get my book, The Tribalization of Politics: How Rush Limbaugh's Race Baiting Rhetoric on the Obama Presidency paved the way for Trump, Amazon, and, and anywhere else online. And see, that's how I got through the whole, the whole title without stumbling. <laughs> yeah, you got to have it ready. But uh, yeah, all right. And if you haven't gotten it, uh, do do make sure that you do so. Uh, your, whether you can find it at your independent bookseller or yes. on Amazon or direct from the publisher, uh, we'll make it easy for you and provide you all the links that you need to make sure that it's in your mailbox real soon. Okay. We can do it. Thanks so much. Uh, and we'll talk with you again soon, I hope. Thank, that's, that would be great. Thank yes. you, David. Take All right. care. Take care. And time now to uh, get ready to hand things over to Justice Putnam for his program, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And I think, uh, why don't we start in early 
this time, early for me anyway, on uh, what he's got in store for you. And today, I guess more important than ever that uh, we round up the stories that he's got waiting for you because I feel like uh, as wide-ranging as the conversation was, things are happening at a pace that we just can't keep up with. And there's always something we're missing out on, and we count on Justice to back clean up for us. What's he got today? Lawmakers heard testimony from Mike Pompeo's former senior advisor. We didn't get to discuss that. But many top-level Trump officials are refusing to comply with the impeachment inquiry. On the rest of his menu here today, hate groups are abusing the tax code to fund their dangerous activities. Hmm, Something else we ought to be cleaning up. Taking a cue from the Trump White House, Uber and Lyft refused to appear before the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee inquiry. See, we need to draw a line about what you can and can't get away with. In uh, for congressional inquiries. And the United Auto Workers win major gains, thankfully, for workers in a tentative deal with GM to end the month-long strike. More news that we have missed, unfortunately, in the crazy rush that we have going on here. After the break, and at the chef's table, the international segment of things, the Australian Intelligence Agency wants more resources to counter foreign interference in their elections. Can you believe it? It's happening everywhere. From Daily Coast Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to the Kegro in the Morning Show with David Waltman. And remember, it was the Australian Diplomatic Corps that started off our own investigation into what has happened in our own election systems. Lastly, here, Amnesty International urged Hong Kong to immediately investigate a bloody attack on the leader of one of the biggest pro democracy groups there. Can't take your eye off of that ball. We'll be back tomorrow.